Good morning. morning. How are all of you today? Good. Good to see all of you on this beautiful Lord's Day morning. Glad you are you glad you're here? Well, I'm glad I'm here too. (laughs) This time last week I was on top of a mountain. Uh, literally, and uh, now I'm down in the plains, and there you go. Uh, it's good to be here, though, and praise the Lord for all the good things He's done for us. Good to see all of you who are here today, especially those of you who are visiting. Uh, got one couple here, hadn't been here for a while. Good to see the Doyles. <laughs> uh, a lot of memories. There you go. I'm sorry, folks. I'm just, you're going to see them well. There you go. It's just good to be here today and give the Lord praise. And those of you who are visiting, thank you for being here with us this morning and celebrating the Lord together with us. And, uh, well, we will hope you come back. We're here today to give him glory for a lot of good things. And obviously, we're going to celebrate in a lot of different ways this morning as we normally do on our Sunday morning worship services. But first, let me let you know a couple of things tonight. Of course, we have services after church this morning, our Sunday school hour. Hope you'll plan on being here for that uh, tonight at uh, 6 o'clock, soup supper. And hope you'll be here for that. We're going to get together for that and have a great time of fellowship. Then afterwards, the believers will be singing. So I uh, hope you'll, well, we're just looking forward to a, a great evening and, and know that the God, God is going to bless us through that time. Wednesday night, our regular time of study and praise and, and hope you'll be here for that. We're continuing in our study and we're in the life of Joseph right now. And it's been a good study. So come Wednesday night and join us for that. Um, next Sunday, of course, is what? Boy, I'll tell you, (laughs) next Sunday is, amen, amen, so uh, we hope you'll be here next Sunday. I talked with Sam the other day, he's excited about coming, I'm excited about seeing him, and I, you know, I realize, I, 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 talking and uh, talking with him, realize I act like I really know him so well, and I realize I have never met the man. Uh, we've talked on the phone several times, and the reason I know why we get along, or we talk about, we have a lot in common. He grew up in Huntington, West Virginia, and so I talk about this person, that person, you know, we just, but anyway, I'm looking forward to meeting him and his wife, Ronnie, and they're going to be here next Sunday, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So be praying for that, folks. We've got one week, more week to get prepared. Uh, we do have, I think, I saw more of the flyers that are out on the tables. If you want to take one, stick it up somewhere. We're, of course, getting the news out on Facebook and other uh, social media efforts and things of that nature. So, yeah, we're just looking forward to next week. Um, coming up, obviously, very soon are some other special times to kind of make you aware of as we end. Oh, one thing, I, uh, let me just, as I begin this time of talking about what's coming up, uh, if you would like to have a lily for Easter, make sure you see Laurel. She'll be uh, at the table in the uh, foyer after service today. They're $15 a piece and she can sign you up for those. I'm saying that because I know next Sunday is our last Sunday. The cut off on that so if you want to get one ordered make sure you do that. Some things that are coming up of course are uh, regarding our Easter time uh, we'll have sunrise service and I'm mentioning that because we will have breakfast. We're going to have a sign up sheet for that and I, we just didn't get that prepared. And then we will be having this year on the Thursday before Easter, a Monday, Thursday time, we'll have a Seder dinner. And uh, I'm look, looking forward to that, that time and hope you'll plan on being here for that evening. We'll do that once more. And then, of course, Easter Sunday, I've already mentioned sunrise service. And then we've got a lot of great things planned for Easter worship as we normally do. So that's coming up, obviously, within just a few weeks. So put those times on your schedule. Uh, well, speaking of schedule, don't forget board members. Tomorrow night and Tuesday night are our board meetings. And, oh, I should have mentioned, Wednesday night we are going to have a time of business in our time, in our time because we've got to get some caught up on some things. It's been a while since we've done that, so that will take place Wednesday evening. Now, uh, am I forgetting anything, or does someone need to qualify anything I've already mentioned? 
shout out and say this is what needs to happen. Ah, yes. Choir tonight is at 5, and the uh, CIA will be meeting at 4 o'clock for rehearsals. So CIA tonight at 4, choir at 5, and then, of course, super, supper at 6. Anything else I need to, we have failed to mention? Well, I'm, are you still glad you're here? <laughs> I am. Uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's just good to be back with you. And uh, so let's celebrate together. Stan, start with a hymn this morning. And we'll, I can't even remember. Yeah, close to the, oh, sit down. Uh, we used to sing that song. Oh, when you're up, you're up. And when you're down, you're down. And when you're only halfway up, you're neither up or down. See, you never know with me, do you? Hey, I we have some members of the CIA with us today to lead us into our time of worship. So, fellas, would you please take over? During the 40 days of Lent, the Christian church prepares to observe the Lord's passion and resurrection. We examine ourselves as we remember the suffering and sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. In this season in repentance, and fasting, we come to terms with our mortality and need for God's mercy. The candles on this cross represent Jesus' life and ministry. Each week we extinguish another candle, remembering how we, the human race, rejected Jesus Christ, the light of the world. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus. Praising God when all the people saw it, they also praised God. We extinguish the third candle as we remember the people who rebuked the beggar, the blind beggar and seek to prevent Jesus from healing him. Jesus announced earlier that his mi mission, including the recovery of sight to the blind, the people close to Jesus, his disciples, were supposed to partic participate in this mission. They should bring the blind beggar to him. Instead, the people close to Jesus tried to silence the blind man who desperately needs to help. I don't know the disciples' mo <coughs> motivation in this account, but we know we can be just like them. How have you ignored those who are most hurting? How have you neglected your mis mission to announce the good news of the kingdom of God? When have you refused to, to your neighbors? to Jesus. Thankfully, Jesus won't be stopped. He will reach out and bring healing despite our neglect and refusals. Who in your life needs to know Jesus, grace and healing? How might you bring them to Jesus? Pray with me. Holy Spirit, we believe you are on the move, bringing health and wholeness to a hurting world. We know that you call us to reach out to others as well, but sometimes we refuse. We refuse to see those who need you. We refuse to slow down in the midst of your busy lives. We refuse to minister to those who hurt. Forgive us, Lord. We thank you that you won't be stopped. You will help heal and save no matter what. Help us remember how you sought us out. Thank you for the people who used to bring us to you. Please help us to be more faithful to the mission you gave us. Give us compassion and boldness. Give us the grace to repent so we might seek first your good, true, and peaceful kingdom. Amen. Amen. Thank you, fellas. Now, if you don't mind, before we sing our hymn, let's sing something else. Well, we, if we have someone, anyone have a birthday today? If you do, bring your funds up and put them in the church and we'll sing to you. Oh, yes, we do. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right. Happy birthday, Lady May. <laughs> we got any um, 
anniversaries coming up this week. Raise your hands, shout. Do I have, yep. How many? 49. All right. Thank you, Jeanine. Jeanine. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay, I'm not missing anyone. I'm not missing anyone. Is there anyone out there? <laughs> Let's stand close to thee. Let's sing. And of course, what is taking place next week? Yeah, hey, you're getting better. Yeah, we need to be praying for that. And we got, so be praying every day, folks. This will be a really good time of celebrating the Spirit of God and letting the Spirit of God work in our midst. As we think of needs, I know uh, we want to remember Lois Arndt, uh, not Arndt, Lois Stroll uh, in our prayers. Um, she, as far as I know, is still in the hospital. Uh, she had some is issues with heart and then fell this week, broke her collarbone, is back in the hospital. So let's be in prayer for Lois. Uh, be in prayer for Kendall and Zanna. I know Kendall had a, a fall. We need to be praying for him. Um, others for whom we need to be praying, uh, let me know. Keep, keep Michael and Harold in our prayers this morning. Anyone else? Well, let's uh, join together in prayer and uh, ask the Lord's encouragement and direction in our lives, in our hearts, and in our church. Let's pray. Father, we come to you because there's no one else to whom we should turn, Lord. Uh, <laughs> going anywhere else is, is just, well, it's vain. It's just void. It's just empty. No one else can supply for us what you can. There's no one that can bring salvation, no one who can bring hope, no one who can bring true encouragement the way you do. And so we come to you this morning acknowledging that and realizing that and asking for your encouragement in our church. I pray for true revival. And Lord, we just have planned something next week, and we look forward to that. We pray you use Sam and his wife, Ronnie, in a mighty way. But obviously, it's up to us. We don't need to just sit back and listen. We need to act. And I pray that the Spirit of God would spur our actions as we move out for you. I do want to pray to thank you for how you're caring for us in so many ways. And I pray for those who are in need of your hand, need of your touch. I think of Lois. I pray for her. Think of Cleve as he continues 
the treatments. Uh, I think of Kendall and Zanna. You know the health needs there. We lift them up. I pray for Harold and Mike, and we just uh, ask that you would continue to be with them and their ongoing needs. And I just pray for others that you know about that are in need of your encouragement and direction and healing. Thank you for what you will do in these people's lives and the lives of those who have needs. We know you meet needs, Lord. Uh, Paul talks about having all his needs met through you according to uh, the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And thank you for that promise and that hope. Now we pray for this time as we gather together to celebrate you, to honor you, to, to sing about you, to give to you. And I know that then listen to your word and other things that are going to take place today. I trust, I just trust that all that we do and all that we say would be for your glory. Lead us I now, lead us now, I pray, in your presence. Help us to always follow you. Help us, I pray, to be unified in spirit as we unify our voices and pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to have the kids come up front just now. We'll have the children's story. <coughs> Well, hi there. How are you today? Good. I should use my, uh, I've been down in Tennessee, so I should actually say, hi, y'all. But uh, I, it makes me feel right at home. Anyway, good to see all of you today. I am so happy to be here. But you know what? I am so very, very, very thirsty. Man. I, I'm sorry. You're, you're just going to have to forgive me. I, I just got to have a drink. I'm so thirsty, you know? Ah, that's better. <laughs> have, you, <laughs> have any of you ever been really thirsty? Yeah. You know how that feels when you're thirsty. You just got to have a drink of water. Well... <laughs> this last week we had our two youngest grandkids. They were, I think they were here last, just last Sunday. Yeah. So they, they stayed with us as we eat. No, not last night. They've been, well, anyway, sometime. Edie and, uh, and um, Sully. Anyway, Edie, you never know. It, you, ne you never have to worry if, she's, if, if she needs a drink or something because she'll tell you, I want water. So, yeah, there you go. I remember one time being really, 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 really thirsty. I was on a hike with my, it was back when I was in Scouts, and I was about, oh, I don't know, 13, 12, 13, and we were hiking in the uh, Wayne National Forest, southern Ohio, back miles from anywhere, out in the boonies, and we had canteens with us, but it was a long hike, and up, down, you know, warm day, and we all, every one of us, there were a bunch of us, and we all ran out of water. And we thought, oh my goodness, we got a little ways to go, and we're out of water. Now, we weren't in danger of dying or anything, but you know, we were really thirsty. Hot day, ran out of water, more hills to go over, you know, and we just kept going along the trail and thinking, all I can think about, oh, oh, I need a drink. I need a drink. I need a drink. Well, finally, we came on the stream. And I'll tell you, nothing has ever looked so good to me in my life than that stream. So you know what we did? We drank. And it was good. Now, by the way, don't do that now. I mean, of course, we were way back up in the mountains, uh, hills, and it, it, you know, it was okay. Don't, you, you don't, don't do that. Uh, but anyway, we were thirsty, and I, nothing ever tasted to me so good than that water that day. It was so good. I was really thirsty. Well, Jesus talked to a thirsty woman one time. Did you know that? He was sitting by a well, and this lady came to fill her jug of water. 
and he said, hey, would you give me a drink? Well, he probably didn't say, hey. I don't think Jesus ever said, hey. But he did say, give me a drink. And the lady said, notice he didn't have a cup to roll with him, so he was going to do that. And he said, you know, I have water that if you knew about this water, you would drink it and never thirst again. And she thought, wow, give me some of that water. That would be super. Then I'd have to, then I could quit coming and drawing water from this well. But Jesus said, no, I'm not talking about the kind of water that's in the well that takes care of your physical thirst. I'm talking about the fact you've got a greater need, a spiritual need, a need that's way down deep inside of you, your inner you, your real you. You've got a thirst there for things that have to do with me, things that have to do with Jesus. And I want to tell you about what you need to do there. Because I can take care of that thirst that you have, that spiritual thirst. And that's something that's really, really important. The way we take care of that, all of us are thirsty for real water. But you know, or physical water that we can see. But you know, we should also be thirsty for, to know more about Jesus. We should also have a big want to in our hearts to know him and to know what we can do to please him. And of course, the first thing we do is we can, we can come to him and accept him and ask Christ into our hearts. And I know some of you have done that. I've said that before. Maybe some of you are thinking about that. That's the most important thing. And that's what takes care of that thirst that you have inside of you for something other than just this water. It's the water that Jesus can give you that takes care of you inside. Another thing we can, things we can do that helps with that is we learn more about Jesus and we come to church and hear about him and pray and things like that and talk to our moms and dads and our Sunday school teachers about Jesus. That helps with that as well. So remember, you know, I know at times you're thirsty for water that we have like right here and that, that we need water. But just as we need that water. We need the water that Jesus Christ can give us that takes care of us on the inside. And we learn about that through talking to Jesus. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now. Jesus, we thank you that you take care of the spiritual thirst that we have, the thirst that we have inside for you. And I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for your love. Thank you for watching over us, dying on the cross so that we might know you. In your name I pray. Amen. Here we go. Who can satisfy the spiritual thirst that we have? Jesus. That's exactly what we need to do. Come to Him and ask Him to take care of us. And that's exactly what He does. Let's stand. Let's sing. Because he's mighty to say.
thinking you're just something. You're just thinking great. You can see from it and all that, and then someone just hits their switch and says, ah! Because you've got your lights on. They want you to get up. Turn them down. Folks, the world wants us to get our dimmer switch. And guess what? Break your dimmer switch. You know? Break your dimmer switch. We cannot hit our dimmer switch. We've got to shine like crazy. Because you know what? We've got people that need to know Jesus. We have people that need to know the message. And we need to do that through the power of the Spirit. And we're going to sing this one. I threw a curve at these guys today. I thought we'd all do this one. Well, it's an older one, but we'll see what happens. And that's one of the reasons why I'm out there now. Maybe to lend my weak support. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. What? What? Oh, okay. Did you hear the one about the guy that needed to kill some time during praise band worship? Well, hey, let me just talk about the fact. Aren't you glad that you have someone in you that's greater than the one that's in the world? Aren't you? Someone say something about your statement. Who's got a word of that? Doesn't have to be long. As a matter of fact, I don't really want it to be long. <laughs> word of the Lord. Someone. What's that? Everlasting. Amen. He's everlasting. Mighty to save. Mighty to save. You know, where would we be without the, the Savior? We'd be lost. Someone else. <laughs> I think we got power. <laughs> Someone else. He's always with us. Always with us. Amen. Never leaves us nor for safe. Isn't that a marvelous thing? Marvelous stuff. Well, it sounds like we've got power. No, no, I guess we're not. Not quite yet. We're going to sing about the power in just a minute because the Holy Spirit is with us, folks. And we need to just unleash the Spirit. You know, we just need to say the Spirit every day of our lives. Spirit, you've got to take me. You've got to use me. Here I am. Do what needs to be done. Oh, man. I can hear now. Let's go. Let's sing. Greater is He is in there.
how much we know of our precious, loving, caring Jesus. Jesus the Son. Steve, I'd like to just take a minute if I get to. Yeah. I want to thank this church and uh, all my friends and family for. I, I don't have the words to adequately thank you guys for what I've experienced. Cards and uh, gifts, food. Uh, it's a bit overwhelming for me and my family. But I do love you all. I want to thank you all. And uh, the prayers especially. Folks, I've come to learn that Prayers don't necessarily affect the outcome of our desires, but it, from personal experience, it sure can affect the person that's being prayed for. Um, it's just been wonderful. Thank you all.
people, I tell you. If that song doesn't get to you, then your getter's gone. You know? We're looking at Jesus on the cross. And I uh, missed last week, I know, and Dave preached a marvelous sermon on heaven. Today I want to continue with our series of Christ's words from the cross. I, I hope we, we talked about how what we're seeing here. Turn, to, by the way, to John chapter... Well, that's the wrong... Yeah, I got the wrong... I'm clear over in Romans. That's a good, good book too, but John chapter 19 is where I need to be and where you need to be. In just a minute we're going to read this. But you remember I told you, I'm hoping you kind of get in your mind that every one of these words, every one of these things, these scenarios that take place when Jesus speaks is a picture that is telling a story. Each statement he made, there was purpose in that statement. And it portrays something really special. And that's what we're going to look at today. Another one, something that he said that is just special in many ways. And, and I don't know. I, it, was that, that, it was his prerogative. You know, why did he say the things he did? You know, why? why? We don't know, but he, he still, he did. What, what's important is that he, there were things he did say that just as important as the words he said when he was living and ministering are the words he said as he was hanging on the cross dying. And that's why we're looking at this, this, this passage today. And today we're going to get a, a picture that uh, is just absolutely marvelous of our compassionate, loving Lord. So stand with me as you have hopefully turned to the 19th chapter of the book of John. And let me read to you beginning with the 25th verse. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his house. Father, encourage our hearts and our minds as we celebrate you today. As we look into this passage, I pray that you would help us to understand uh, what you're saying to us, Lord. Realizing that we need to follow you and everything you said while you were on the earth is important. These words were uttered just not long before you died for us. They were uttered for a reason. And I pray that the Spirit of God would bring to our hearts and our minds clearly what you want us to know because of what you said. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. My mother, uh, many of you remember mom, pretty much the last couple years of her life, as is with many folks, uh, had to be cared for uh, 20 round the clock. Um, my Aunt Frida stayed with her, and Frida did what she could, although Frida, um, well, she, you know, she just didn't get around real well. And I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, people ask me about, you know, did you play football? I did, but my, my, and did you do this? Did you do that? Did you, and I never had a job heavy lifting. I'm just jeans, people, jeans. <laughs> and I don't mean blue jeans. I mean jeans, you know, that, involve deoxyribonucleic acid and all that good stuff, DNA. That, that's what has me. Because my poor Aunt Frida, uh, as I see her and remember her, yeah, bad back, bad joints, can't lift her arms. You know, hey, there you go. Mom, but she did, she stayed with mom, did actually quite a bit and helped us as far as not having to worry too much about having someone at night and what have you. But during the day, we'd have someone there. And I, I say this, and I guess I 
I, it just always, and I know many of you have been that way, being the child away, <laughs> you know, that always bugged me. Now, I didn't, my brothers never had, that was never any real problem with, with that, just the way it was, you know. <laughs> it's just that, uh, you know, I just, wish I could have done more. And when I was there, I'd do what I can. It's kind of interesting. Some things happened when I was there that I thought, boy, I'm glad I was here because like one night, her nebulizer shut down. And old poor old mom, I remember Frida hollering, Steve, Steve, what are we going to do? And uh, I said, no problem. You know, uh, when she needs her treatment, wake me up. I'll, I'll unhook her. She was on oxygen 24 hours. Just unhook her oxygen machine plug it into her pipe, and there you go. And anyway, uh, things happen. I don't know. I'm just praising the Lord that I was there that night to help her because, you know, Mom needed her oxygen. She needed her nebulizer and all that. So I was able to do some, but I just wanted to be there more because I, I love my mom. <laughs> I want to make sure she was okay as best as you know, she could be and taken care of. And there, there was nothing I wouldn't do for that lady because all of her life, <laughs> and she, she was, well, not all of her life, but the time that I, I probably felt like a lifetime or more than sometimes felt like, well, I don't know what it felt like, but raising three ornery boys like she did. But... <sighs> I always felt like there wasn't anything mom that wouldn't, wouldn't do for me. So obviously when it came to that point in my life, yes, of course, I'm going to do everything I can to care for her because I love her. And so when I come to this passage, I am not surprised by what I see. <laughs> you know, some people express, I, I guess in one sense, not, well, not, not too much, but find it rather interesting to see that here is Jesus and he's waged in a cosmic battle here. He's got the sin of the world weighing down his shoulders. He, he's dying for the all of mankind. I mean, thinking of that, you're talking about an incident of cosmic significance. Uh, right, that was it. That is, was the most, that was an event that took place that, to be quite frank, we often wonder, well, what's the most important event in history? Hey, we're talking about it. Right there, hands down. <laughs> and in the midst of all this that's going on, and you see it reflected in other things he says, and has already said and is going to say, but in the midst of all this, Jesus took the time to make sure that his mom was going to be okay. <laughs> that is absolutely marvelous. Let, let's, we're, going to, we're going to talk about that. Let's first of all talk about the fact that Christ is concerned for the people he sees. Now, I'm doing a little bit of an extrapolation on my first point here. Because it mentions, you know, four people that are there around the cross. Starts out with that. Um, Mary and her sister and and Mary the wife of Clopas and uh, and Mary Magdalene and and the disciple whom Jesus loved which is John by the way and as you perhaps well know but if you don't know I'll tell you now that's John <laughs> and it doesn't say explicitly that he saw them but well it goes on to the next statement that says he saw his mom his mother and the disciple there. Well, I, they're all there together, so he couldn't have missed them. <laughs> but it's fascinating. It's just absolutely marvelous to me to think. Christ, in the midst of his agony, and yes, he was hurting people. I know he was God. I've said that many times. He still was fully human. He felt everything that you and I would have felt. There wasn't any divine barrier thrown up when it came to his feeling pain. Now, I know some people take pain more than others, and some people think, well, maybe he just had a high pain tolerance. Well, obviously he did, but you know, he, he was fully human. 
He felt what was going on. He felt those spikes in his wrists. He felt those, that spike in his feet. He felt the corn, uh, the crown, corn, the crown on his head. He was hurting from the stripes on his back. Actually, the blood running down his back, too, because we've talked about, I haven't talked about it for a while, but what they probably used would not just leave you with a stripe, it would leave you with a, a uh, it would tear open your flesh when they whipped him. And he's there experiencing all that in the midst of all that and the struggle that's going on between him and bearing the weight of the sin of the world. In the midst of that, he sees his people. <laughs> you know? Now what I see from that is a couple of things. Nothing really earth shattering, but it's a reminder to me that there's nothing Nothing, nothing at all that will ever keep Jesus from seeing me. Nothing will ever keep Jesus from seeing me. You and I can become distracted and not see things. How many of you ever had that experience? I know you have. Have you ever had someone kind of a little miffed at you because they say you ignored them? And you may did, may have. But you didn't intend to. It's just that something, when they were there or whatever, you know, you, you saw something else and didn't recognize them. And I mean, we, that happens to us all the time. I, I have had to, when we're taking care of our grandkids, especially the itty bitties, oh my word, you know, I wish I had eyes all over, not just in the back of my head, all around my head. Have you ever been there? You know? Because, I mean, you have to be careful, especially when you're out with, I don't need to tell you this, but do I? You, when you're out with them in public, I mean, you turn your head and you turn back and, where'd they go? <laughs> and <laughs> I, I shouldn't belabor this, but I got to tell you this story. I'm going on a rabbit trail here, but we stopped at a Dollar General in Deering, Ohio. Now, I know you don't appreciate what I just said in that, but Deering, Ohio, People, that's out in the boonies. And I cannot believe that where my favorite store in all the world used to stand, there's now a Dollar General. Baker's General Store, <laughs> long gone. But they put a Dollar General there, a big one. And I went there, stopped there, and I walked in. I thought, wow, this is nice. Sherry and I were coming back from, I don't know, her sisters or moms somewhere. Well, we had, this has been years ago, we had uh, Maddie and uh, Colin with us. And this is back when Colin would have been maybe just about the same, no, probably the same, about three, you know. And uh, we went to the Dollar General, and we kind of turned our heads, both of us, and guess what? Colin disappeared. Well, I, I had a chuckle. I, I, my first thing, I laughed at first. And I thought, well, it's coming back to me. Because I knew he was in that store. I knew there was only one way out of that store, so I wouldn't really too scared. We'd, we'd, there wasn't anyone else in the store hardly. We'd get him. So I wasn't really concerned about that. But I had to chuckle because I thought, I remember my dear mom telling me about a time in Kresge's Five and Dime when I took off with a lawnmower, one of those toy plastic lawnmowers that had the clack, 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 clack. And Kresge's had wooden floors. <laughs> and I mean, it was just, people could hear. Mom knew she said I was scared, but yet, I knew where you were. Because I could hear you go, clack, 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 clack. But her and my Aunt Frida chased me for a good long time before they finally caught me. And I thought, that was the first thing I thought of when Colin took off. <laughs> I had to say, Mom, I know I deserve this. <laughs> you know. But that never happens with Jesus, does it? It can never happen with Jesus. No matter what's going on, no matter the amount of wants that people have, no matter the amount that's of prayers that are going up to him all the time, Jesus always has his eye on you and you and you and me. And you know what? Never is that eye gone. Never is it off of me. He knows everything. 
I look at this passage here, and I know he sees them in the midst of obviously a very distracting situation. That's what John writes. He saw them. He saw them. He sees these people. And he's concerned about these people. We see that more as we go on. And actually more explicitly was going on. I said, I told you my first point, I kind of extrapolated a couple things, but it's, it's more plain in my second one, more explicit. When we see that he is concerned for the mother he sees. Um, they were, as they were there um, around the cross, when Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. Woman, here is your son. He saw his mom, his mother. And in obedience to the law, because <laughs> the law had said, you know, you know well, we, I guess to kind of back up, uh, I, I don't want to assume too much, but and frankly, I do assume, and I assume that you know this, but I assume, got a lot of assumptions going on here, don't I? I assume Joseph is dead. Um, you do not see anything mentioned in Scripture after Jesus was about 12 years old, that incident at the temple. Joseph's there, but that's it. And it's kind of another kind of interesting thing is, you know, you never hear Joseph saying anything. <laughs> well, you know, he, he perhaps, no, by this time, perhaps is dead. But Jesus, as the oldest son, shows his obedience. He's showing his obedience by dying on the cross, but you know, he doesn't stop there. He says, I've got a responsibility here. I need to take care of my mother. And so he says to his mother, woman, behold your son. Now that's interesting to me in a number of things. For one, what I've already mentioned, the fact that Jesus is doing this in this, in, in this situation where, you know, you're talking about a, a, a big scope of things here, and he's stopping at this point and making sure that this one, this person is taken care of. Woman, behold your son. Now, by the way, in case that word woman bothers you, it, it is not to be no, no big deal. That, that, well, it is a respectful term. Some people say, he, he doesn't look at her and say, woman, you know, there's your son. No, that's, no. It, 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 don't you remember when his, his very first miracle, you remember how he addressed his mother? You remember his mother said, you know, do something about the situation. We preached, I preached about this not long ago. You know, the water into wine thing. And how did he address her then? Woman. You know, you don't know what you're asking. It's, it's not a disrespectful term. It's just a me a may of addressing her. And it's very direct. Here is your son. I find it interesting also to think about the fact that, now wait a minute, Jesus. You've got brothers. They're mentioned. We know he has brothers. They're mentioned in the scripture. And later on, two of his brothers end up writing some of the New Testament. You ever hear of a book called James? See, that was written by Jesus' brother. Not the apostle James. He's dead by the time that epistle's written. And have you ever heard of, have you ever heard of Jude? A little book, Jude? Guess who that is? That is the brother of Jesus. And I thought, wait a minute. He's got other brothers. Why doesn't he entrust his mother's care to them? Well, an obvious thing to me is the fact they're not there. <laughs> they're gone. And perhaps, apparently, even at this point, they still do not know what to make of their oldest brother. <laughs> uh, that's not an... I've lived that all my life, you know. My brothers never, their times, they don't know what to make of me. Good night. But anyway, they never, at this point, apparently, they still do not know what to make of their oldest brother. So he wanted to ensure that his mother was cared for by someone he trusted and loved and cared for very much, because it says that here. 
And also, I think, another perhaps a thought here, is the reason he entrusted his mother, his loving, precious mother, whom he loved very much, by the way. The reason he entrusted her into the care of John is because, well, John, John was a believer. <laughs> he knew that not only would she get physically taken care of, but obviously there's a spiritual element. So at that point, it was, this is, well, this is the way it happened, and it happened because there was no mistake here. I don't think Jesus was laying there, sir, hanging there thinking, ah, good night, James. Good night, Jude. Can't you show up every now and then and help a guy out? <laughs> no, I didn't, that wasn't his, this was, in, this was the intent. Because there, there was apparently advantages to this benefits to this. It was the best course of action. Right here, she was, he was there, John was there, and she said, woman, he said, behold, woman, behold your gunikos, behold your huios. Woman, behold your son. This is your son. This is one that is going to be your son just as much as, as if he was your real son. <laughs> and so Jesus is concerned for the mother he sees, and wants to take care of her. And so he entrusts her into the hands of an individual that he trusts and loves. That's why John always says, I'm the disciple Jesus loved. Now, let me ask a question before I move on too quickly here. <laughs> Could Jesus trust the care of his mother in your hands? Does Jesus trust you that much? Are you living in such a way so that you've demonstrated yourself trustworthy to the Savior so that if need be, He would entrust to you a great responsibility and a great calling? Is that where you are? Could He do that? Now, lest you usher a sigh of relief by saying, I know that'll never happen because his mother's not, his mother's not around anymore. <laughs> not so fast. People, in the hands and the lives and the hearts and the minds of every believer here this morning, Jesus has entrusted something to you that is very precious. Do you know that? He has. The Apostle Paul calls this concept stewardship. Do you know what a steward is? A steward is one who takes care of something that is not actually his, but he takes care of it in such a way as if it were, were actually his. And Paul says we are stewards of the grace of God. Followers of Jesus Christ. Now people, not just the preacher. Huh. or the deacons, or the trustees, or the Christian Ed Committee. Every believer has been entrusted with the care of the grace of God. Now don't you think the grace of God, we talk about the grace of God a lot, don't we? <laughs> don't you consider that something pretty precious? Yeah, I do. And to whom has that been entrusted? Paul says, you and you, and you, and you, and you, and me. I am to be a steward of the grace of God. So yes, he may not have entrusted into my hands the care of his mother, but he has entrusted into my hands the care of his story. How am I doing? Am I living? Am I saying? Am I talking as if someone who is worthy of that trust? <laughs> I hope you are. Can you imagine how much he must have loved John and trusted John to be able to do this? Well, people, he loves you just as much. You know, John says I'm the disciple he loved, and that doesn't mean that he loved all the other disciples less. It's just a distinction he uses. Because he loved them all. And he loves us all. Of course, the question is, 
can he trust us? <laughs> well, that's up to you, you know? So you need to demonstrate your love for him by showing him he can trust you. So Christ is concerned for the mother he sees, and he takes care of her future. At that point in time, the oldest son, the oldest son's not there. John, you're the one who's going to take care of my mom. But he, he kind of goes the other way around and says he's concerned for the disciple he sees. And what does he say? Woman, here is your son. And then he says uh, to the disciple, here is your mother. Now, I think he does that, and of course, he does that because he, that's what he wants to do. And how can I question the, the, the words of a dying man and, and, and the agony he's in? But he does it because he wants to emphasize, yeah, you, this goes both ways. This is your mother. Now, what does a mother do for a son? Well, you know, it's interesting. Even an adult son, the mother would still have some care, consideration for, and have a relationship with. In other words... John and Mary are entering into a relationship established by Jesus right there on the cross that it's going to be mutually encouraging and beneficial and helpful. Now, I find that fascinating in a number of reasons. But the one big thing is, number one, is that, you know, John already has a mother. <laughs> you know? You remember his mom? She's the one that came up to Jesus. Hey, Jesus. Well, she probably didn't say hey either, like, just like Jesus didn't say hey. But she came up to Jesus and said, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, would you let my sons sit one on the right and one on the left of you? Now, man, that, that's a mother. <laughs> you know, isn't that incredible? I mean, what a bold request. Jesus, I want my sons right next to you. And so it's not that he didn't have a mother and not that he didn't have a mother who loved him. And apparently was concerned about spiritual matters. But for some reason, I, I don't know whether his mother had died. Uh, that may have happened. Uh, that would have had to have happened recently. Because, although it's not mentioned in Scripture because that incident with his, the mother and Jesus happened not long before Jesus was crucified. But he wanted to make plain that this was to be a mutual relationship. You know, John, you take care of her. Mother, you take care of him. And there must there mutual benefit there. And from what we, we don't know for sure, because you can do, you read a lot of early church histories. Of course, they only go back so far. And, and this is not a biblical reference, so don't take this to be the the gospel, <laughs> like we're preaching from the gospel. But many have said, um, well, I think it's in a Eusebius, Ecclesiastes, not Eusebius. Ah, what's the name of that? Ecclesiastical history. I can't remember the name of his author. Anyway, he, he said that John took Mary into his home, just as Jesus said, and she lived with him for about another 12 years before her death there in Jerusalem. So he, that was... What we see from a historical source that we don't know how accurate it is, but there you go. So in other words, it, it happened. He did what he was asked to do. She did what she was asked to do and to form this relationship. But it was all because in the midst of this pain, in the midst of this cosmic struggle that was ongoing, in the midst of everything that was taking place right there at that spot in Jerusalem on that day, Jesus saw people he loved and was concerned about them and wanted to make sure their needs were met. Huh. Don't we serve a wonderful Savior? <laughs> See, that's just the, that's that's Jesus. He's wanting not only to make sure that his message goes out, the message of his death, burial, and of course, his ultimately, in a few days, his resurrection, but he's wanting to make sure that those he loved 
are cared for. Their physical needs are done. And he's wanting to make sure that there's, there won't be any, any, any need to worry on their part. That's the kind of Savior we have. That's the kind of one we follow. Man, don't you want to do something for him? Don't you just, doesn't that make you want to do something for him? I hope that it does. Because obviously there's much to be done. We need to show care, compassion. Just like what Cleve was talking about a minute ago. That's what we should be doing as the church of the living God. Caring for the needs of others. We should have our ears to the road, listening for things that need to be done. And of course, primarily and most importantly, we need to be bringing the message of Christ to others. But in, we do this because it's mirroring the character of Christ that we have seen manifested so many ways in the Gospels. And that character continues right here, right up to his very dying moment. He doesn't break character. He shows his care by saying to his mother, woman, here's your son. Son, here's your mother. Wow. Oh, that's the Savior we have. The Savior we serve. Let's live for Him. Let's pray. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I hope today you know this Savior that we've been talking about. I hope that you have experienced His care and love for you by asking Him into your heart as your Savior and Lord. And if you haven't, I'm going to pray in a minute, and why don't you, while I'm praying, make that decision. Ask Him into your heart. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart as my Savior and give me the hope of life. If you want to do that, if you, are, if you do that, or if you want to do that, I'm going to ask you as we stand and sing in a moment to come and let me know you've done that. Or if you want to talk about what you need to do, come and let me know. I love nothing better than to show you from God's Word how you can know you're His. Christians, are we people Jesus can trust? If we were standing by the cross of Jesus, were we a person standing there to whom he could look at and say with all confidence, here is your mother. You need to take care of her. You need to watch over her needs. Does he trust us that much? Remember, he's entrusted with us the care of something great, the grace of God. Are we living up to his trust? Father, encourage our hearts and our mind that as we follow you, we might show you how much we love you by living a life that demonstrates we're worthy of your trust. We're worthy of the trust of your son as we are stewards of the grace of God. And I pray this morning that as we see Christ demonstrating compassion, we would always be compassionate and caring and loving. Even at times when we <laughs> don't feel like it, or in positions where it's just not the easy thing to do. Christ did that. Help us to mirror his character in this regard. If there's someone here that needs you, bring them to yourself, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, sing our final number together. Where he leads me, I will follow. Big question. Will you follow him? I trust you will. Where he leads me, I will follow.
be more of the person that God can use. And so let's be praying for her as a church uh, and her desire to do that. And maybe there's others that need to do the same thing she did today. You know, God, we need to be the kind of people God can trust. And are you? <laughs> you know, the kind of people Jesus can trust. If you're not, then get get right. <laughs> get where you can be, because that's what we should be as we follow him. Let's remember all the needs that we have. Let's remember the that's what we said we're going to have. And next week we're going to have... Yeah, amen. So be praying for that, and we'll be coming back and looking forward to that. Uh, hope to see you tonight. Hope to see you in a few minutes in class. May God bless you as you... Uh, Follow him. I'm going to ask Tyler Gast, if he would not mind, to lead us in our benediction. Father God, I'm so grateful to you guys together here in the church family. Just ask you and give us the strength and encouragement to do what you ask us to do. Ask you to give us the strength and encouragement to shine our light bright for you so that others may see it and want to be drawn closer to you and learn about you, Lord, so that they may have.